Greetings. I'm going to try to keep this uh, as short as I can. Um, for a quick recap from last week. Um, so last week we talked a little bit about how um, discipline of anthropology approaches things broadly. And we discussed anthropological methods uh, and how that was going to structure our approach to the subject of war, perhaps in ways uh, that are different from how other disciplines might. For example, uh, we talked about the notion of ethnocentrism, um, with ethnocentrism being defined both as judging another culture by the um, standards of one's own, and also seeing one's own culture as inherently better than others. Um, we understand, uh, or we understood that we're going to be approaching uh, the things that we study in this class as a matter, generally speaking, of cultural behavior, meaning um, when we say that, usually that, that means learned behavior. Uh, for anthropologists. Uh, put simply, when we study war, um, how people fight it, how people understand it, how people justify or condemn war, uh, we're going to be approaching those subjects as values that people uphold because they learned them, uh, not because any one people in the world is inherently one way or the other. Uh, and we also talked about war, uh, the notion of primitive war, uh, though this is a term that anthropologists do not currently use. Um, uh, we studied three horticultural groups uh, from different parts of the world, from the Amazon, from Papua, and from the Philippines, and we noted that for each of these groups, uh, conflict is usually avoided, and these societies were structured on uh, complex relationships with people around them, uh, often through kinship arrangements um, and things like that, and when they do conduct war, uh, it's often to right a wrong or to settle an issue that came up, um, often because of the violation of um, uh, local norms. We learned that the raid um, was the common method of warfare in these groups. Uh, they'll carefully sneak into an area, uh, launch a very quick attack, and then try to get away as quick as they can uh, without getting caught. And we also witnessed a mode of warfare that was comprised primarily of posturing. Two groups sort of face off, uh, and they try to intimidate each other. They'll throw spears and shoot arrows, but they don't look like they're really going out of their way to try to actually kill each other. Uh, and it came up in our class that perhaps societies such as these have a harder time uh, imagining losing people. Um, they're smaller societies, and they feel the loss a lot uh, when someone dies, so they don't want their uh, modes of fighting to be particularly lethal. Uh, people do get killed sometimes, but usually not in a large scale. So for today, I had you read a selection from The Chrysanthemum and the Sword by Ruth Benedict, and I wanted to talk to you about that reading for just a moment. Uh, first of all, I want to reassert that um, for this section of the class, uh, this, this first part of the semester, it's not really our goal to try to be as critical with our readings. Uh, we're just gonna look at assortment, uh, an assortment of war-related texts, mostly things that were written by anthropologists, and we're gonna try to look at some different perspectives of something called war. Uh, we're trying to look at a wide range of source material. And with that said, um, a lot of people do have some, some real critiques about this book. Uh, a lot of Japanese people and scholars of Japan have argued that this book is unfair, and that it makes some massive generalizations about Japanese culture based on this narrow snippet of time um, under extreme circumstances, uh, referring to World War II, of course. Also, as we mentioned last time, uh, the war itself pre prevented Benedict from conducting actual in-person research in Japan. Uh, she knew this, and she acknowledged it in your reading. However, it's been noted that she um, did take a lot of her material from Japanese American informants, um, some of whom some of who had very strong feelings about Japan based on their own personal experiences there. Um, some of those experiences weren't very good, uh, and maybe that's not the best way to get a good unbiased read of a society. Uh, in application, this book ended up being pretty influential. Um, maybe you've never heard of it, but um, you probably have in your life seen some of the um, impact of the way that this book framed Japan. Um, much about how the construct of the uh, the construct of the emperor of Japan is imagined in in the world um, derived from this book. Uh, before Franklin Roosevelt died, uh, 
Benedict was responsible for convincing him that when Japan did eventually surrender, um, that the emperor should be allowed to retain his throne. Um, so another, um, another minute to talk about Benedict. Um, Ruth Benedict was an early 20th century anthropologist. Uh, was very influential um, in, in her time. And I mentioned to you last time that the discipline of anthropology uh, went through a lot of changes in the early 20th century. It disavowed uh, the notion of race being um, something that's biologically valid, for example. Um, and the discipline of anthropology uh, began to assert that all human beings are psychologically equal to each other. Anthropology turned away from the tendency that does still exist in contemporary society to arrange different groups of people according to um, how modern or primitive they are, for example. Um, that's not something anthropology does anymore. Um, and anthropology became, you, you might say, a more progressive uh, discipline. And one figure that was very important in this movement was an anthropologist named uh, Franz Boas. And he was a professor at Columbia University. His students were a big part of this movement that directed anthropology in the, um, towards what it's become today. And his students included, uh, for example, uh, Margaret Mead, who you may have heard of. She's considered to be one of the most famous anthropologists of all time. Um, and Ruth Benedict was kind of like Boaz's um, protege. She was his top student um, and was a mentor and peer also of Margaret Mead. Uh, Benedict became the first woman of any discipline to become the recognized leader of a major academic society. Um, she led to the American Anthropological Association and the American Folklore Society. In her time, she was seen um, by some of uh, some some people as being dangerously progressive. Uh, and many of her peers, particularly a lot of powerful men who opposed women being leaders of anything, um, were pretty resistant to her um, influence. However, from a contemporary perspective, she's seen a little bit more as a person of her time, whose views, uh, which were progressive by the uh, standards that she lived in at that time, uh, they were limited by her status as a privileged white woman in the American Ivory Tower. So another, um, another criticism uh, that we see is, um, of the book is from the discipline of anthropology itself today. And as I think it should be clear to you, uh, this study was actually funded by the United States government as part of the war effort during World War II. Contemporary anthropologists um, tend to disavow making a contribution to a war effort, uh, any kind of war effort. And for this reason, um, the study of a group of people uh, commissioned by a nation that's trying to understand them for military purposes would not be considered appropriate um, or, or legitimate by the contemporary discipline of anthropology. So um, with that said, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, um, I did not assign you this book because I'm trying to teach you how, uh, like objectively, how Japan and Japanese society approaches war. Rather, I'm trying to show you how someone understood how Japan approaches war uh, in the 1940s and particularly how she saw uh, the Japanese versus American, or she might say Occidental approach to war being different, Occidental meaning European-based uh, society. Um, she saw there being differences in like this, this kind of pan-Occidental approach to war versus Japanese approaches to war. And she started with what she saw as an apparent contradiction, and that's what the title, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, is supposed to represent. Um, and the chrysanthemum represents one thing and the sword represents something else. She said that we, and that means uh, Americans or Europeans, will find Japanese culture to be confounding and contradictory. Um, oversimplifying this, she says that the Japanese are both um, aggressive and servile. They're both brutal and gentle. And she uh, says that these strange ways can make sense, though, if you try to understand Japanese uh, society a little bit better. She declares uh, that there's something called the rules of war, and she states her belief that any Occidental nation uh, can 
kind of reasonably expect each other to honor some similar customs with regard to how we fight, how we surrender, how we treat prisoners, and things like that. And there was and continues to be um, a persistent belief that Japanese soldiers during World War II did not follow these customs. Um, when Japanese prisoners of war were taken, they acted in people thought strangely, um, and people saw, uh, understood that the Japanese military's treatment of us um, as POWs, uh, American, that they had taken prisoner, uh, they saw that treatment to be inhumane, particularly inhumane. Um, and I should say here that for, whatever, for whatever it's worth, there's a good bit of research that suggests that American soldiers in the Pacific actually treated Japanese soldiers and prisoners very differently than how they treated Nazi soldiers and prisoners during World War II. And by differently, I mean uh, they treated Japanese soldiers and prisoners worse. And there's uh, considerable evidence for that, but that's, that's not the scope of Benedict's argument. She's not considering that um, idea. She obviously, in this reading, she has some ideas about um, these values of war and how it's conducted and, and believes um, the two sides that she's talking about here to, be, to, to follow those rules um, pretty much all the time. Um, she says that the United States has different conceptions of different kinds of war and we wage them differently, like total war, for example, that like you go and just absolutely annihilate a place and that there's a way that we do that. Um, but she said that our two nations' different approaches to war uh, were driven by completely different impulses. So while the United States made a point to communicate their own to their own population, um, for example, that um, the United States was kind of dragged unwillingly into war. We didn't choose this, but we have no choice. We got attacked, and the Nazis and the Japanese are killing innocent people, and we just have to do the right thing. We have no choice. We're obligated uh, to fight this war, even though we don't want to. That's not something we want to do. Um, but according to Benedict, uh, Japan communicated to their population that they were in control of the war and deciding to do so. They decided to go to war. It was their idea. And Benedict says that the Japanese um, cared about hierarchies and found them important. And they thought that it was problematic that there were so many countries around the world that were operating under such different codes of behavior. And they needed, they as Japanese needed to um, colonize the Pacific area in China and assert a distinctly Asian mode in those places um, and to drive uh, Western and Russian colonialism out of those regions. Um, and uh, according to Benedict, those are the things that motivated uh, the Japanese in World War II. Um, she also said that when you saw how the fighting took place, that the Japanese were not compelled by math and figures and odds, but rather believed in the power of spirit and will. They knew that they were outnumbered, but they also believed that they had the correct will. And when they lost the war, they accepted in mass that their will must not have been as strong as the others. Um, she also said that when the United States lost a battle, um, as we did, for example, at Pearl Harbor or um, Bataan, uh, we would tell our population that we didn't expect this. We were shocked by the conditions. We, lo we lost the battle. We were trying to fight it, and we lost because it was a mistake or something like that. Uh, but when the Japanese lost, according to Benedict, um, they would tell their populations things like, we expected this, and this is all part of our plan. Um, and she also said that the Japanese had a really hard time understanding things like an American uh, naval admiral being decorated for rescuing damaged ships. Um, and that was, um, according to Benedict, a strange, uh, a strange thing to the Japanese. She also put a lot of effort into talking about how prisoners behaved uh, when captured. And according to Benedict, Americans and other European nations, um, we will surrender when we realize that we're beaten. Um, but then are then sort of expect certain conditions while being kept as prisoners, um, such as the ability to communicate with family and that sort of thing. But she said that the Japanese did not expect to be taken prisoner and believed that it was their duty to fight to the death. And that meant that when Japanese soldiers were successfully taken prisoner, 
um, it seemed like it changed who they were as people, and they didn't seem to express desire to have their families contacted, and sometimes they would do things like cooperate with their captors as if their spirit had been broken. Um, that's how she saw it. Again, one interesting distinction uh, that Benedict makes is to ask people to differentiate between uh, the Japanese emperor, for example, uh, and Hitler. Uh, she felt like Americans badly misunderstood the role of the emperor in Japan and noted that the average Japanese person and soldier uh, did not necessarily equate the emperor with the war effort or the violences perpetrated by war. Uh, for Germans, uh, whether they approved of the war or not, they all seemed to see Hitler as being central to it. Um, whether they were happy with that or not, they saw Hitler as being totally entwined with and responsible for uh, the role that Germany played uh, during that war. Uh, for the Japanese, according to Benedict, the emperor was the state itself, uh, and they did not necessarily see him as being implicated in how the war turned out either way. He was just, he was just there and categorically correct. Um, so what would I like for you to take from this reading? Um, as I noted earlier, this reading is not something that I assign to you because I want you to take it as an accurate account of the Japanese approach to war. Um, there probably is some truth mixed in there, um, but some of it is Benedict's intervention. Uh, Benedict believed that there were different ways um, to understand cultures. And what I mean by that is um, she did something that anthropologists do not really do anymore. Um, but she tended to classify cultures according to patterns. She believed that she believed in cultural relativism. She believed that cultures were all different, but she also believed that you could kind of apply these schematics and categorize and group cultures according to different um, patterns that she named. Uh, for example, she believed that some cultures were what uh, she called guilt cultures, and some were what she called shame cultures. She saw the United States and Japan as being exemplary of each kind. She saw Japan as being a shame culture. And what she meant by that um, is that the notion of public shame is used to compel proper behavior from people. It's a public thing. People will be publicly shamed for non-normative behavior, and people behave uh, because they want to avoid that experience of public shame. They don't want to be a shamed person. Um, but she saw the United States as a guilt culture. Um, so thus, instead of public shaming, she said that guilt, guilt cultures force people from an early age to internalize a strong sense of guilt um, with ideas about what kind of kinds of behaviors are dirty and wrong and, and um, things like that. And then it creates people in those cultures who kind of police themselves internally forever and ever and ever. And that's how guilt societies compel proper behavior from people. Um, so this is a notion that stuck around for a little while that came uh, very much from this, this book. Um, this is later in this book, she makes this argument and felt because she felt like Japanese society and American society are each exemplary of these two archetypes of disciplinary behavior in society. Uh, but anthropologists don't really um, do that anymore. So the big thing that I really want to show um, was that there is this, you know, kind of American European idea of, of war and how war is supposed to be conducted. Um, and that is from a European or American society. And from that perspective, Japan and Japanese culture was seen as something profoundly alien to that. Um, the motivations of war and how one acts in war were seen as being very different. Uh, but I think that with that said, that it would be interesting to read that in contrast to, or, or along with some of the readings that we did last week. Uh, you might recall from an Alangit perspective, for example, that they conflated uh, the ways that Japanese and American soldiers behaved in war. 
And to the elongates, um, that was something else and was something completely alien and did not make sense to them. Uh, so that's something that I'd like you to think about here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Um, and I hope that you have a good week and I look forward to seeing you all on Friday. Take care. <laughs>